Hello and welcome to another podcast episode of the project BioFruitNet. My name is Sophie Tanner and I'm meeting online with three experts on stone fruit production. My name is Radek Vavra. I am from the Research and Breeding Institute of Pomology in the Czech Republic. My field is research and also I am an advisor for, for organic fruit growing. Welcome. So my name is Clémence Boutry. So I work at the Research Institute of Organic Agriculture in Frick, Switzerland. And uh, I work in the department of fruit growing and I, I mainly take care of plant protection trials and of variety testing. Thank you. Welcome, Clemence. Hi, Sophie. Hi, everybody. Eligio Malusa. I'm working as a researcher at the National Institute of Horticultural Research in Skierniewice, Poland, and dealing mainly with this uh, organic uh, fruit production of uh, fruits. Great. So then I would like to start our conversation about stone fruit production by asking what are the most important challenges for organic stone fruit production. So varieties and rootstock play a big role in uh, organic fruit growing. At present also uh, in the future, the choice of suitable varieties and rootstocks is and will be a major challenge uh, to the success of commercial cultivation of stone fruit species in organic conditions. It's appropriate to reflect on the situation of the future decision with regards to history, to the present and predictable trends of the future. We have records about fruit cultivation and records of existence of varieties from ancient time, from Rome Empire. For stone fruit species, we use taxonomic system of apricots that is called Prunus armeniaca, and for peaches is called Prunus persica. After that, for centuries during the early modern period, relatively few varieties originated as a selection of promising random seedlings were cultivated. The turning point came in 20th century when the fruit cultivation began to develop more for the supply of market in growing cities in Europe. It's necessary to realize that until the 20th century, stone fruit were grown in a fully ecological system, but we cannot take experience from the past time because aspects and needs changed organic fruit growing. So today's organic stone fruit growing diametrically different. For example, a fundamental factor that affected cultivation of most stone fruit varieties in 20th century was the global spread of plant pox virus, Sharka disease. Uh, this Sharka disease eliminated lots of plum varieties from cultivation from the usable gene pool of the Prunus genus for next breeding that existed until this time. <clears throat> Subsequently, next breeding changed with a significant uh, cha challenge for rapid creation of new quality varieties tolerant to this Sharka disease. In fruit breeding around the year 1970, a new period started in the development of varieties and, and later also in the development of new rootstocks. Breeding of new varieties started to focus with the aim of developing resistant varieties to many pathogens. Another fu fundamental change is the requirement for the health status of the planting material. Virus-free material is required now. The breeding process was gradually transformed into a commercial matter with a legal framework of reproduction rights. Yeah, so Radek uh, talked a lot about varieties. When, when I think the challenges in stone fruit, first I compare with stone fruit and palm fruit. So 
all the stone fruit species have the fruit have much more delicate skin so they are more sensitive to attacks of pests and diseases and then the second difference is that they flower earlier so they're also more prone to frost damages so we also we see with the climate change that the frost occurrences the frost events especially late frost are more and more often so it's accumulating and we have very little to do um, that we can do here especially for high stem trees and then when I think of the new pests that are coming, um, probably every everyone heard of it, of the spotted wing drosophila, also called drosophila suzuki, which is a very tiny fly of about two millimeters that can pierce the, the delicate skin of all the stone fruit uh, fruits, so apricots, cherries, plums. And um, as opposed to the cherry, the, the fruit fly that we know from the kitchen that flies around, which is the, the one that is common uh, in Europe, the new invasive pest Rosophila Zutsuki, which comes from Asia, can uh, attack healthy intact fruits. So this is a huge problem now uh, for our high stem cherry trees, especially here in Switzerland, that we have um, a hard time to protect. So for commercial orchards, and when I say commercial, I say fruits that are for table consumption, that are directly eaten freshly. It's now become standard to have a full netting of the orchards. So we have low stem trees, uh, maximum yeah, two and a half, three meters high with a, a net of one of one, one to one millimeters. So very fine mesh that the drosophila cannot penetrate. And uh, this netting also has an effect against the second major pest, which is the cherry fruit fly, also called Ragoletis terrasi, that lays the eggs inside the fruit, like drosophila. And then these are the little white worms that you see inside the fruit when you <laughs> when you eat one. Yeah, you rather have to swallow it entirely and not look inside the fruit because now it's very common, especially later in the season when uh, both pests are to multiply and eventually they will still find a little hole to enter the orchard. I think that uh, in this respect uh, about the, the, the little larva that is growing into the, into the fruit, maybe uh, it could be an idea for marketing of organic cherries particularly because for the late varieties this is quite common if uh, the, the the control of the pest is not uh, so successful and it is let's say also uh, very difficult in, in, in organic fruit production because there is now a trend of uh, eating uh, insects and actually these uh, these larvae are a source of uh, protein so maybe there could be an idea for for organic fruit growers uh, to to market them as a new, let's say, product and not just a simple commodity as a cherry, organic cherry, you know. That's, so just uh, maybe think about uh, this uh, aspect. Sometimes, you know, they, they could be worth it to try. I think this needs, well, there we need to work on the culture aspects of eating insects because uh, in Europe, at least, it's still... Um, common to be disgusted by insects. It's not something that is included in our diet naturally. And uh, I said, yeah, netting is the most common. It's because in organic, we don't have that many options for direct plant protection. We don't want to use powerful insecticides that would kill everything, not only the pest that we target, but also all the beneficials. So one approach in organic farming is to use preventive measures, to um, use barriers, like physical barriers between the pest and the fruit. And this is the same approach for diseases. Like the main uh, fungal disease in stone fruit production is Monilia. So it's a family of different fungi, um, which cause Monilia blossom and twig blight, and also Monilia fruit rot for all stone fruit species. So again, uh, cherry, plum, apricot, peaches, nectarines. So these are all the stone fruit species. And here, one approach is that we cover 
the trees with a rainproof protection starting from beginning of flowering on until the end of the harvest and then we would close the cover when the first risks of snowfall occur that could because of the weight of the snow on the protection that could make the whole uh, infrastructure crash. So why from beginning of flowering on? It's because the this is the time point of infection of the Manila fungus, which enters through the flower when there is some wetness, so when it rains. So if we protect the trees from the rain, the fungus has not the optimal conditions to actually infect the flowers and later on the fruits also. So I, I have a question. These rain protections, they are above the tree or do they cover the tree wholly and also protect against the Trisophila suzuki as well? So the cover is used above the tree only. And since the orchard is uh, built in rows, the cover as well is like in a row and the, the structure uh, uses the same sticks than the ones that stabilizes the tree with um, the wires. So it's um, something that you can use for both stability of the tree and then to put the roof on top. And it's like an umbrella. It's a half circle above the trees. And so every row, every uh, protection is connected to the next one. So it's like one big roof where in between there is a space of maybe 40 centimeter, half a meter. It depends on the system. But if rain and snow occurs, that there it can drop down in the middle of the tree row. And then the netting is just around, but it's connected to the roof, which makes the whole system closed, more or less. And also, I didn't mention, but now for Drosophila suzuki, it's not necessary to cover the top. They fly only at up to a certain height. So actually, just a lateral net would be sufficient. But now, if also thinking about new pests that could occur, now we have the, the complete system closed. If I can add uh, about this, uh, the problem of uh, that uh, Clemence was mentioning, lack of, uh, uh, let's say, active substances that can be used so in organic farming, so the need of uh, uh, eventually preventive or, or other methods, let's say, for the protection against pests. Uh, uh, we have developed in, uh, in Poland uh, uh, a trap for mass trapping of uh, fruit flies, mainly. It's uh, useful for different kinds of, uh, of species of the ragoletis, but even for Ceratitis capitata which is the Mediterranean fruit fly. And, uh, and actually it is uh, very simple because it is based uh, on a solution of, uh, of a fertilizer, which is the ammonium phosphate, uh, which can be built you know, very easily by the growers in themselves. Okay? So using uh, uh, the, the plastic bottles that we normally use. Actually, I don't use anymore because I'm against the, using too much plastic, but, but uh, a lot of people are still using you know, the, the, the water uh, plastic bottles, so you can fill them with the, a solution of 4% of this, uh, this fertilizer, because you can use it as a fertilizer normally, even though it is allowed uh, as a basic substance in, uh, in organic farming. So coming from the food because it is used also for for example for the um, for the preparation of cakes you know at home uh, and the smell that comes out of this uh, of this solution attracts the the, the flies so you can really uh, catch a lot of them and you need to put around 80 to 100 bottles per hectare uh, it is better if you put them at the height of uh, three, four meters than to a lower uh, height because uh, it's, it's ma much more effective. And actually, you know, you need, uh, it's a quite inexpensive, I would say, you know, uh, system because there are also some, uh, let's say, small devices that have been developed uh, by different uh, companies uh, in Italy, in Poland, uh, I think also in Germany to, to allow let's say, hanging these, uh, the bottles on the, the three shots or branches, shoots or branches. And um, so that's uh, something that could, uh, I think, uh, uh, maybe not alone, but eventually also together with the, with the say, protection that uh, Clemence was mentioning, uh, really 
reduce a lot what is the pressure of the population and so the, 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 the risk of damage uh, to the fruits, particularly of cherries, because these are those that are more uh, affected by such kind of pests. Do you think it would also work in high stem trees that are not protected or will it just increase and attract even more to, uh, of the pest? No, I think I think that uh, it should work also there. I mean, for the same reason that I was mentioning, you know, that uh, if you need to put uh, to a, you know, we tried, you know, two meters, four meters, and, you know, four meters, we had 50% uh, almost more catches than a two meters high. So that that could be, um, I think, a solution also for that kind of uh, trellising system. I know that also for high stem trees, you could also spray something onto the fruits that make them less attractive to the pest. But then uh, you have a side effect is that you cannot clean the rinse the fruits again. So it's it's difficult to have like a white layer on the fruits and tell the consumer, no, this is completely harmless. You can save, you can eat it, but still the aesthetics. Uh, is very important in your you choice know, part, part, of yes, particularly for for fruits like uh, cherries. You know that you know that the appeal of the cherry is the color mainly. You know, so that's. Uh... But I would uh, come back a little bit if you allow me, Sophie and uh, Radek and Clemence to what Radek was mentioning. So about the the problems with the varieties, you know, and the selection of the varieties. What are the challenges for the future? I think that uh, Radek made a very nice, uh, let's say, overview of what was the the history in uh, in the selection. But I think that also in uh, a challenge, particularly for the organic farmers, uh, would be, uh, let's say, in uh, using varieties that have been selected, and, and you know, for for uh, stone fruits, particularly for uh, for peaches, uh, it's a very quick uh, uh, change of varieties. Uh, because it's a, it's a very high, let's say, breeding uh, effort uh, all over the world. So, for example, also with the introduction of this, uh, uh, the Prunus platicarpa, you know, so the, those the, the, the peaches that are flat, you know, the flat peaches, so-called, uh, which found also a very interesting market. So it's actually the market. So the, to take into account what the market uh, really wants, and to match actually because sometimes these new varieties are a little bit more less tolerant to different pests and so on so if the 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 organic grower wants really to to sell on a market which is requiring such kinds of varieties it founds also probably a, an additional disadvantage okay in, because uh, uh because of the of the cropping system i mean of the, of the methods that he has to apply which sometimes are not so suitable Radek, what do you think about that yes lots of uh, varieties are now released for for growing uh, stone fruit varieties but we don't know too much uh, about uh, those varieties in organic conditions so we need more experience with growing varieties in organic conditions so we need uh, lots of testing and also we cannot say that one variety is suitable for all conditions for all locations so no one variety that uh, will be grown in all condition exists so we need uh, we need more testing and we need more information about varieties from different locations and uh, we need to spread information about varieties are there varieties that are resistant to the pests that Clemos mentioned we have varieties that are uh, that are resistant to pathogens uh, many pathogens or that are tolerant to some pathogens but i think that uh, we have no varieties that will be resistant to some pests so breeding of uh, new stone fruit varieties is focused mainly to resistance or to to be tolerant to pathogens yes in this respect i think uh, actually it would be uh, good to have the support of the methods of the orchard management you know in order to decrease eventually the 
the pressure from pests, uh, insects or, or, or uh, mites, uh, and uh, uh, through the ecosystem services that uh, some uh, soil management practices can provide, uh, for example, in, by increasing uh, the, uh, the population of uh, parasitoids uh, or of predators that, uh, that can be then feed on the um, on the pests that are present or so reduce their their damage you know we have several uh, uh, examples of uh, of possibilities uh, as in case of uh, living mulches uh, for example that have been also tested in france uh, specifically on uh, stone fruits uh, peaches and apricots uh, and they found uh, uh, that several of uh, of the plants uh, that they that they tested were actually successful successful in in this respect. Uh, maybe also Clemence can can have something to say on this uh, on this subject. Yeah. So regarding variety and pests, uh, now especially for the fruit flies, it's uh, the time po point of maturation of the fruit has the most impact on if the variety will be infested a lot or less. So early varieties will be less infested because it less matches the life cycle of the pest and late varieties when the pest has already multiplied, the infestation pressure will be higher. And also, as Elijo said, the, the whole orchard management and the climate, you can do a lot with this influencing the climate to suit or not suit the pest. So for example, the, the, the fruit flies, they like warm and moist climate. So what you want to do uh, to, so that the pest doesn't feel good in your orchard and happy is that you, for example, mow the grass regularly, keep it short so that you, it's less moist or you um, adapt the thinning of the trees in a way that the, the canopy is aerated, like the, the air can circulate freely. Uh, and especially in protected orchards, the climate is warmer and moisture. And uh, it makes me also think about the black cherry aphid, for example, in the cherry organic cherry production, like um, it multiplies and it's promoted by the protection system that we uh, implemented. So this is a side effect of it. And now again, we try to um, this imbalance that has been created in favor of the pest, we try to counterbalance it by promoting beneficials like antagonists, uh, predators, parasitoids, uh, implementing flower strips in the orchard, not closing the net too early to let all the beneficials come in and only close uh, the net just before fruit ripening, um, before maturation, when the, the color starts to change from yellow to red and becomes very attractive to these pests. So. Are there also some beneficials that you can that are actively grown and that you can purchase? Yes, I think uh, there are. Uh, I thought that uh, Clemens uh, would uh, would uh, uh, intervene, but uh, there are several, let's say, you know, several uh, predators that are uh, so called, you know, uh, not specific, so generalistics one. Uh, which are uh, bred, you know, there are some companies, you know, in Holland, even in Italy, uh, that are producing such kind of uh, predators. And uh, uh, I'm not sure about specific uh, uh, parasitoids uh, in case of, uh, of the stone fruits, uh, uh, but it is possible that, uh, that also for this, uh, at least some uh, are present for the probably the most uh, difficult ones, you know, that uh, I'm thinking about uh, cot seeds, you know, something. And there is, there is in this case also some, um, some parasitoids available for those that are attacking uh, the stone fruits, you know. Yeah, just for clarification, uh, for people who might know, not know the, the term parasitoid. So it's a little wasp that lays the eggs actually within the pest and uh, develops inside and, and basically eats the pest from inside out and then uh, hatches, the adult hatches from, from this. And so, yes, you can purchase and release beneficials, but if you don't create an orchard that is attractive for them, they will also leave right away. Uh, so one of the beneficials that is um, 
present in the orchard very early on in the season and the earlier the better because then you, the control will be easier is the hoverfly and the adult hoverfly uh, feeds on nectar of yellow and white flowering flowers so if you don't have these flowers in the orchard it will leave it so the adult lays the eggs inside of colonies of aphids so all kinds of aphids knowing that aphids are very specific to the crop most of the time like the black cherry aphid attacks cherries and then the larvae feeds on the aphids so the larvae becomes a pupae and then out of the pupae hatches the new adult so i would i would add that uh, orchards especially cherry orchards are equipped with plastic covers and in in this uh, orchard uh, with plastic covers there are a little bit uh, different conditions for developing of uh, pests uh, different than in open open orchards so uh, some pests uh, in uh, in the orchard with, equipped with plastic covers the conditions are more comfortable for development of some pests as uh, aphids and mites and we have in the Czech Republic good experience with uh, introduction of uh, predator predator mite Tiflodromus spiri in the orchard for reduction of uh, development of uh, mites uh, in the orchard so there is there is some possibilities to protect to fight against uh, pests so the the plastic covers that you were mentioning that are the rain covers is that the yes same? yes the, yes plastic covers are uh, mainly used as a as a uh, protection against um, rain induced fruit cracking I would uh, a little bit return <clears throat> in the Czech Republic. We have good experience with uh, plastic covers. We can uh, spread in uh, in spring uh, if uh, a frost event is forecasted during flowering of uh, trees. We we can spread plastic covers, and uh, these plastic covers can increase temperature inside uh, the the orchard for one or even two degrees. So that's an uh, advantage. Uh, we can we can use this uh, plastic covers for a little bit increasing of temperature in the case of frost event in springtime during flowering, uh, flowering of uh, trees. And then after the frost event, the plastic covers are again removed and then Next spreading is just before before ripening of uh, fruits. Yeah, as just Radek was explaining, this would be the best, you know, protecting the flower over the flowering period from frost and fungal infections. And then actually reopen the orchard to not have the side effects of the changed climate of the aphids, because also aphids don't, don't like rain. That's why it's less a problem for high stem trees that are exposed to rain. And then again, as he said, um, protect the trees just before ripening, because then the fruit growing phase is the, the highest. And if the fruits take up too much water in a short amount of time, the, the cracking, the, there is a risk of cracking, as Radek said. But it's also a lot of work, opening, closing, reopening, reclosing. And uh, usually farmers don't have this time but organic farmers are used to uh, have a higher workload, you know, in order to obtain their products. Uh, so if, uh, if this is worthy as it is, you know, and I think that we really can recommend such, you know, uh, such way of, uh, of protecting the, the stone fruit crops, particularly the cherries, because it is actually a, a, a successful, I would say, method for, for uh, for the production of inorganic farming. Consumer requirements uh, is changing with the time, with the future. So the, the aim of the breeding is uh, according to requirement of, of the consumers. So there is new new requirement for uh, fruit uh, sugar content, for fruit firmness, maybe shape also the size of fruits. So specific requirements will appear in the future. 
Radek, I would ask you one thing about this, because, uh, for example, in apple breeding, okay, there are s maybe not a lot, but some uh, efforts uh, that are a little bit uh, unconventional, you know, I mean, not conventional. So that are uh, some breeding programs that are carried out by, uh, even by the producers themselves, organic, I mean, uh, so to produce uh, new varieties, uh, it's a kind of collaborative effort uh, to produce new varieties uh, that will not be covered pro or protected, you know, by, um, by patent, uh, you know, or intellectual property rights, okay, so that to be freely available for, the, specifically for the organic farmer. Is there anything similar to in, uh, in stone fruits? Yes, <clears throat> of course. Uh, so there are uh, there are breeding programs in different uh, European countries. Little problem is with uh, club varieties or with some varieties that are protected uh, for uh, multiplication. Also, the the aim is uh, to develop to create some varieties that will be tolerant to disease, but will be without any protection, will be free for all uh, growers, fruit growers. So it's also also aim of the breeding programs of Europe. Thank you all for this interesting conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>